At the outset of World War II for the United States in December 1941, the U.S. Navy had seven fleet carriers and one auxiliary escort aircraft carrier in service. By September 2, 1945, at the war's end, the U.S. Navy had 112 carriers that had been in service throughout the war. However, with 11 being lost during the conflict, 101 commissioned aircraft carriers of various classes were in service on VJ Day. This video is intended as a quick overview of each carrier class during the war, so I won't dive into too much detail. This is for those who are new to history, and this could be used as a refresher for all those historians out there. I also left timestamps in the descriptions if you'd like to jump to each carrier. One note before going to this list, Langley CV-1, America's first aircraft carrier, is not included on this list, as she was converted to a seaplane tender in 1937. She did see action in World War II and was lost, but not as a carrier. So let's jump in. The Lexington class consisted of two 36,000 ton aircraft carriers converted from battle cruisers in the 1920s due to the Washington Naval Treaty. These ships were distinguishable by their large smokestacks on the starboard sides, separated from island structures, and were the largest of the U.S. carrier designs before and during World War II. Lexington was lost during the Battle of the Coral Sea in May 1942, and Saratoga fought throughout the Pacific War with an active service career and survived. She became a nuclear test subject during Operation Crossroads at Bikini Atoll in 1946. She survived the first test and sank after the second nuclear bomb blast. She is now a diveable wreck at Bikini Atoll. Ranger was the first designed and built keel-up aircraft carrier for the U.S. Navy that came into service in 1934. Prominent visual features were six hinged exhaust stacks that could be rotated parallel to the flight deck during flight operations, her most distinguishable feature to other U.S. carriers, and a small island added later in the design. The 14,500-ton ship had several design deficiencies, such as a lack of underwater protection and propulsion speed for a fleet carrier. Ranger served in the Atlantic as a ferry carrier due to her deficiencies to actually fight in the Pacific War. She played an active role during Operation Torch, the Allied North African landings, with her aircraft attacking Vichy French, ground forces, and naval targets. She was last used in active combat in October 1943 against German shipping, and was sent back to the U.S. as a training carrier, and was eventually a night training carrier in the Pacific. She was scrapped after the war in 1947. Known as the first modern carrier for the U.S. Navy and the most modern going into World War II, the Yorktown class originally comprised of two 19,500-ton ships, the Yorktown and Enterprise, ordered in 1934 and 1935, respectively. The design addressed Ranger's deficiencies and added better flight operation features as part of lessons learned from fleet exercises. The main distinguishable feature of the class is the combined design of the island and smokestack. A third ship, Hornet, was ordered in 1939 due to the expiration of naval treaties limiting a nation's aircraft carrier tonnage, and since Yorktown was the best design at the time, they built an additional vessel. All three ships were quickly thrown into combat against the Japanese. Notable events in 1942 were the hit-and-run attacks on islands by Enterprise and Yorktown in early 1942, Hornet and Enterprise at the Doolittle Raid in April, and Yorktown's involvement at the Battle of the Coral Sea in May. In June, all three participated in the Battle of Midway, resulting in the loss of Yorktown. Hornet was lost at the Battle of Santa Cruz in October. Enterprise, the sole survivor of the class, served the rest of the war in nearly every single major action. She was the most decorated ship in the U.S. Navy during World War II, and with 20 battle stars to prove it, she was scrapped in 1958. The Yorktown and Lexington-class ships bore most of the brunt of the Japanese from 1942 to mid-1943, before a large surge of new carriers came into combat service. WASP was a single ship class designed in 1935 as a product of the Washington Naval Treaty limitations. As of that time, the U.S. still had 15,000 long tons left after the construction of Yorktown and Enterprise. WASP was a 14,700 ton carrier laid down in 1936 that was essentially an improved Ranger class with an attempt to squeeze more modern features of the Yorktowns. Commissioned in 1940, the carrier notably featured the first ever deck edge elevator 
which proved successful and would see implementation to this day on future carriers. However, WASP was still a flawed vessel with limited protection. As a note, WASP was already under construction when the treaties expired which led Hornet, the third Yorktown class ship, to be built. During the war, WASP would serve alongside the Royal Navy, assisting them in the Atlantic in 1942. By May, the intensity of the Pacific War prompted the U.S. Navy to transfer WASP to the Pacific, where she arrived in August to the Solomon Islands vicinity. In September, she was attacked and sunk by torpedoes from a Japanese submarine. The most modern U.S. fleet carrier design seen in combat in World War II, the 27,000-ton Essex class, started life in 1939 building on the Yorktown class design with the main goal of creating a larger air group. Now free of naval treaty limitations, the Essex class featured a larger flight deck to handle more aircraft, a deck edge elevator for better flight operation efficiencies, and better protection. 26 would be ordered, with only 24 being built in total during and then after World War II. 17 were built and commissioned before the end of World War II, while 14 would see active combat during the conflict. The main distinguishable visual feature compared to the other fleet carriers at the time was a smaller island structure and smokestack combination, along with the four twin 5-inch 38 caliber guns on the flight deck. Essexes were broken into two subclass designs, known as the short hull and long hull Essexes. These were the only major visual distinctions between the ships when commissioned. Short hull ships had an overall length of 872 feet, while long hull ships were 888 feet. Though they both had the same waterline length, the length of the ship that's touching the water, long hull Essexes were fitted with a clipper bow to improve sea keeping and allowed for more anti-aircraft guns in the front of the ship. The long hulls were unofficially known as a Ticonderoga class subtype. Of the 17 Essex class carriers that were commissioned during the war, seven of these were long hull types. The four that saw combat were Ticonderoga, Randolph, Hancock, and Shangri-La, while the three other commissioned long hull vessels that did not see action were Boxer, Antietam, and Lake Champlain. The Essex class, along with the Independence light carriers, which we'll cover next, would comprise the main offensive force of the U.S. Navy from mid-1943 onward until the end of the war in September 1945. This class was critical to the success of the Allied forces in the Pacific mid-war on. None were sunk in combat, while many were damaged, two ships in particular, the Franklin and Bunker Hill, were the closest to being lost during combat due to their severe damage. Their survival was credited to their sailors, superior damage control operations, and sturdy construction of the carriers. While the Essex-class fleet carriers were starting to be built in spring 1941, and were not expected to be in service until 1944, War was looming and the U.S. Navy was in need of more carriers. The interim solution was to produce smaller converted aircraft carriers for quicker availability while these were being built. A feasible light carrier type conversion concept gained traction in October 1941 and would undergo construction in early 1942 after the Pearl Harbor attack. Requiring 10,000 ton Cleveland class cruiser hulls built up to their main decks as a base, Nine Independence-class light carriers were constructed to help supplement the U.S. fleet in the Pacific. Though they featured a small air group in comparison to fleet carriers, their main strength were their ability to maintain speeds similar to fleet carriers. As for visual cues, the class were originally not supposed to have an island. However, it proved effective to feature one, so a small island was added in. Four exhaust stacks were rigged out of the way of the flight deck on the starboard side. The ships were top-heavy, featured minimal armor and flight deck protection, and boasted only medium to short range anti-aircraft weaponry. Now coming in at around 14,000 tons, all nine would be commissioned in 1943, with the first in January and the last two in November. The Independence class, in tandem with the Essexes, were the spearhead of the U.S. Navy mid-war on. Princeton was the only loss of an Independence class vessel, sunk during the Battle of Leyte Gulf in October 1944. They would be the only light carrier class to see service in the U.S. Navy during World War II. The Independence class, though not as large as the Essexes, filled the shoes of the carrier's loss in 1942 and served as an insurance policy for the Essex class in case there were scheduled delays or issues during their construction.
In early 1941, before talks of converting Cleveland-class cruisers into light aircraft carriers, President Franklin D. Roosevelt pushed for conversions of merchant hulls into smaller carriers, where the first U.S. escort aircraft carriers were born. Based on a C-3-type merchant hull, the first escort carrier conversion took place in March 1941. Spanning a total of three months for a simple conversion, the Long Island featured a flight deck extending most of the vessel, a single aircraft elevator, and aircraft catapult. Notably, she had no island structure, making it the only U.S. carrier that served during the war to be built without one. At 13,500 tons, Long Island was used as a testbed to test feasibility of modern aircraft operations on a short flight deck. As the war started, she was used to qualify carrier pilots and is most famously known to deliver marine fighters and bombers on Guadalcanal in August of 1942. She continued qualifying pilots, but was mainly used as an aircraft ferry for the rest of the war. Long Island was one of two ships of this specific design, the other being the HMS Archer, seeing Royal Navy service only, and that is why she's not included on this list. The Charger was one of four Avenger-class Royal Navy escort carriers, which was nearly identical to the Long Island, plus a small island structure. Originally American C-3 merchant hulls, the four ships were built exclusively for the Royal Navy and launched in 1941. Charger technically was in the Royal Navy, and then in October 1941, she was transferred back to the U.S. Navy, being commissioned in March 1942 and used as a training ship for British aviators during the war. In the U.S. Navy's eyes, she was the one and only Charger-class escort carrier. In 1942, the Bogue-class design was to address the shortcomings of the Long Island conversion. Using a C-3SA-1 merchant hull as its base, the Bogues carried an adequate air group and featured a catapult to make launching aircraft easier for a smaller deck. The ships did have issues in rough seas and were considered woefully protected, such as a lack of underwater protection. For visual distinctions, the Bogues included a small island. 45 would be constructed, 21 in 1942, and 24 in the 1943 build program. A major note is that only 11 would remain in U.S. service, while the Royal Navy would receive 34. The Bogues that saw U.S. service were deployed in both the Atlantic and Pacific. Atlantic serving ships saw combat and convoy protection duties against U-boats, while in the Pacific, ships were mainly used for aircraft ferrying. Of the 11 in U.S. service, one ship, Block Island, was lost due to a U-boat and was the only aircraft carrier for the U.S. Navy lost in the Atlantic during the war. The Bogues were the first mass production escort carrier class and were considered a success. In 1942, four Cimarron-class fleet oilers were converted into the Sangamon-class escort carriers, which proved as the most effective escort carrier conversions. Along with a larger and longer flight deck compared to other escort carriers, they were lower in the water, making them more stable. Their hangar facilities were vastly superior to previous escort carrier conversions and were capable of handling a larger air group. Lastly, as they were originally designed as fleet oilers, Sangamons had large fuel bunkers to help them with their endurance while being able to service other ships that sailed with them. At a full load of 23,000 tons, the four ships Sangamon, Sewanee, Shenango, and Santee all completed their conversions to aircraft carriers by September 1942. All four served together during Operation Torch, the landings in North Africa in November 1942. One carrier, the Santee, would stay in the Atlantic while the other three served in the Pacific and acted as substitute carriers to assist Enterprise and Saratoga until the Essex's and Independence class ships arrived on the scene. Due to their superior capabilities compared to other escort carriers, they were more involved with major amphibious assault operations for the rest of the war. Santee would join the rest in the Pacific in early 1944. The Sangamons were known as the best escort carrier conversion for the U.S. Navy during the war. The following Casablanca class was the first keel-up escort carrier design based on a merchant hull. A true case study of American mass production capabilities, 50 were laid down starting in November 1942 and all were commissioned by July 1944, an amazing feat. The class was based on an S4 merchant class hull and were a slight improvement on the Bogue class, 
The Casablancas had two aircraft elevators and a larger hangar deck. Their downsides included a lack of proper protection and lackluster propulsion for the time period, reciprocating engines. However, even with this type of propulsion, they were the fastest and most maneuverable U.S. escort carriers. 45 would serve in the Pacific, 5 in the Atlantic. 5 in total would be sunk in action. These were Liscombe Bay, St. Lo, Gambier Bay, Omni Bay, and Bismarck Sea. Notable accomplishments of the class included Guadalcanal's assistance with capturing the German U-boat U-505 in June 1944, and the David vs. Goliath situation for a group of six Casablanca-class vessels in Taffy 3 during the Battle of Samar in the larger Battle of Leyte Gulf in October 1944. These ships face incredible odds against one of the most powerful Japanese service fleets during the war, where the U.S. Navy came out on top with the help of the carrier's escorts. The last and undoubtedly best overall and modern escort carrier designed for the U.S. Navy, the Commencement Bay class, was the keel-up designed improvement based off the Sangamon class the Navy wanted all along during the war. Using an Euler hull design, these ships were not approved for construction until late 1942, and they started entering service in late 1944. 27 were ordered, and of the 19 built, 10 were commissioned during World War II, but only 3 saw combat before the end of the war. The last two vessels we will focus on were special and unique to the U.S. Navy. Two freshwater side paddle wheeled aircraft carriers were in use on Lake Michigan, based out of Chicago, Illinois, for pilot training and qualifications. Converted from side paddle wheeled liners, Wolverine was commissioned in August 1942 and Sable was commissioned in May 1943. Though these ships had a flight deck, they did not feature hangar facilities and arresting wires. Around two thirds the length of a traditional fleet carrier, these two ships, known as the Corn Belt Fleet, operated seven days a week, training around 17,000 pilots during the course of their service. They were both decommissioned and scrapped after the war. Here are a few charts delineating what we have discussed throughout this video. Be sure to pause here if you'd like to study these charts. Out of the 112 carriers that served throughout the war for the U.S. Navy, 77 were escort carriers, while 33 were fleet and light carriers. As we just covered, the last two were training ships. I hope you enjoyed this overview. Let me know in the comments below your favorite class or the ones you are most interested in learning more about.